And I'm really excited and happy to introduce Jennifer Steinkamp, uh, the wonderful artist whose work is uh, in our front new beautiful entrance gallery, the Laurie A. Jacobson Gallery. So as most of you know, we've been closed for about 18 months up until the last September 19th. We just reopened, it's not even been a month. Uh, and in that new space, knowing it was going to be kind of this empty, perfect little box with walls, I wanted to do something different than what we've had in the main museum space before. And if any of you knew what the old front space looked like, it's kind of a, uh, 180, right, or 360, actually. It's totally different. And so I had been very interested in Jennifer's creations and her art um, and thought that would be something pretty amazing to put out there and to have in that new space and to really celebrate what we do at Iowa State between university museums and the students and the faculty here on campus. We're science and technology school. Um, it's very important for us to consider that with all the exhibitions that we produce uh, to kind of make those connections to help students and faculty understand that art and science and technology go hand in hand very often. Um, they're not separate entities. And so I'm very excited to introduce Jennifer, who has come all the way from LA. She teaches at UCLA and has to go right back to teach again. Uh, and she okay. has quite a few exhibitions open right now, and so we're really lucky to have her. Um, she's got exhibitions all over the world at mm -hmm. the moment. So we're really lucky that she allowed us to borrow and uh, purchase one of these wonderful works of art to have here at the Brunier Art Museum. So thank you, and let's welcome Jennifer. Well. I think let's, oh, look at that, it works. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. that was really nice. i um, really happy to be here. I'm actually from up north a little bit, where it's even colder, so. <laughs> oh, so you guys have it good here. Minnesota. <laughs> oh, I know, oh. <laughs> yes, oh. Um, so I'll show my work, and I do take questions as I'm going, I think, yeah, I'll do that. Okay, or, or afterwards is fine, or none at all, whatever you like. <laughs> so here we go. Oh, look at that. Okay, this uh, first piece I made as an undergrad student at Art Center in 89, that is an 89, oh, 89. It was um, at a house in Pasadena and at a storefront in Santa Monica, which was part of the Santa Monica Museum. So I scraped up some projectors, I borrowed and begged, and I created these on Silicon Graphics computers. And here actually started the company. So I, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Silicon Graphics, actually. I don't usually say that, but, <laughs> but it's really true. Um, so this, uh, this is the first probably major piece for me because it made me realize I could dematerialize architecture with light. Light has no physicality, right? And so it's, it's kind of an amazing thing that people would actually feel maybe a little disoriented or seasick perhaps when they uh, experience the piece. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and kids know you're supposed to play in them. Let's see. And this was a, an installation with multiple projections throughout the space. I'll just. Um, oh, what? It skipped a slide, really. Oh, okay, I see. That's not going to start again. Okay, too bad. Wow. Well, you just have to guess. Oh, there it goes. Okay. Technology. <laughs> so this is the the sound is actually from the street, but it seemed to go well with it, so I kept it. And this, it's a collage. Is that on a busy street? Yeah, it's on Wilshire Boulevard. Oh, okay. At Acme Gallery, and so it's a collage. It's these water strips uh, that are loops that are cut and pasted together. They are three D. Um, I got a lot of comments on uh, that this was a very painterly piece, and I wasn't a painter, so that seemed peculiar to me, but I mean, obviously, it makes sense. So it's a collage in the space, like multiple projections, and it, the piece is a collage. So people are seeing this from outside, 
Um, on, yeah, this one up here, does that have a pointer maybe? It could be a pointer. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Uh, the Wilshire Boulevard, huge streets out here. And so this one you would, oh yeah, we blocked the, this is such a long time ago, when was that? Oh God, 98, wow. Um, yeah. So, so how, what kind of, what kind of screen did you use? Oh, there's, it's the walls. It is the walls. So yeah, I always, window, I always wall. use the walls because that way I can dematerialize the walls. They become like a different space. Jennifer, is the window, could you see it inside or was it? I don't, you know, I'm tr <laughs> I was trying to remember. I think we must have blocked it during the day, um, but I'm not a hundred, we must have because projectors were not very bright back then. Yeah. They didn't even have lumens. And they, their pixels were this, you know, the size of quarters. Now you have to look, you know, so they're tiny. So does the whole image come out of one projector? But, I mean, everything that's showing is out of one projector? No, there's this wall is a projector, this is a projector. So there's a projector out here hitting the side. It's actually rotated 90 degrees. Okay. And the projectors are placed low so you cast your shadow and become part of the work. Mm -hmm. So you're breaking up the dematerialization or the, you're becoming part of the work and you're also disrupting the illusion. And this, well since you're asking, um, there's a projector here hitting these three wall strips that are made of drywall and there's a projector on the back wall on the, b behind this strip hitting the back wall. And video back then was awful, so the documentation is very fuzzy. So I'm sorry, I guess I have to reinstall this piece. You remember video? You, I mean, we just put up with it, it's amazing. <laughs> God, so this piece, it moves a little bit, so the architecture feels like it's maybe moving. And it tilts slightly. So I was, I was thinking about the scan lines on a television and recreating them huge. <laughs> of course, we don't have that anymore. We don't have scan lines. But nobody thought of them anyway, so it was probably had a very limited audience who knew what I was talking about. Um, this. It's at the Fremont Street Experience in Las Vegas. I was invited uh, to, for a competition and I, I had to convince casino owners that um, abstract animation was something that people enjoyed. So I told them about Fantasia. I told them about uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. There's a, a sort of abstract film in the middle um, and they believed me and they let me make a piece on their gigantic screen, which was, at the time was made out of light bulbs, which to run a, a little, like a three minute test was $750 in electricity. It's really insane, but that's, it's Las Vegas, that's just nothing to them. Um, so it takes about 10 minutes to walk down the entire thing. Uh, they, they own this piece, but I, I don't know if they ever play it. It's, Probably not. <laughs> I'll just show you a little bit. My collaborator, uh, Jimmy Johnson, worked on the soundtrack for this. So is the sound, when you're walking through, you hear the sound? Oh yeah, they had an incredible sound system. It just enveloped the whole space. Yeah. It's, I had never done anything on a curved surface, so I really learned a lot about what, what motion could actually work and emphasize the curb and what motion I would just be killed by the curb. So I think I went there seven times to test it. Yeah. I did do this with my silicon graphics that I owned in my house. <laughs> Let's see. Okay, well. Was this uh, a program that you used to do this? Yeah, I used a uh, software, it was called Alias at the time, now it's called Maya. It's a 3D, it's used, you know, in the 
for all kinds of things, uh, a lot of movies, special effects and things. So at the same time, uh, I was invited to create a piece uh, for this Rotunda Gallery at the Corcoran, which is no longer the Corcoran in Washington, D.C. Uh, so I don't know what's going to happen to the piece, but <laughs> I guess someday I'll find out. Um, let's see, yeah. Uh-oh, hey, that was interesting. Why did you do that? No, go ahead. Um, this was around, right after 9-11, I actually was in New York, but I had just left right before, so it somehow affects, it affects everybody. Um, I decided to create a piece because we were going to war with Afghanistan and I didn't understand it. And I'm a pacifist, so I made a piece, um, a war protest piece, and I named it after Jimmy Carter, which was our only president who was a pacifist, not a warmonger. Uh, and so, yeah, oh, that's my dog. <laughs> she doesn't exist anymore. Oh. So the, the streams of flowers, this is the first time I worked with um, plants. And the flowers are kind of attached to curves that animate like this. And then and they, the software says, oh, now you can go back home. So it goes back like this and it's kind of fun. And so the flowers are hanging on for their life. And I actually thought of these as stripes because I was really the way I, I worked was more abstract up until this point. Let's see. Uh, this is an interactive piece for scientists at Caltech. This is in the Athenaeum, uh, which is a hotel, restaurant, and uh, Albert Einstein stayed there quite a bit. And so it's, it's another protest piece, but it's very soft. Like, so he was, um, he thought it was a conflict of interest for scientists to be involved in the war machine. And most of the funding for, for our sciences comes from, from all, you know, war. So every time a scientist walks through, they create explosions. <laughs> There's sensors along the, along the ceiling here. So the piece is never the same. And it's got two sides. Um, this piece probably changed everything for me. I was invited to uh, the Istanbul Biennial. Um, and there was part of the show was in this, the Yerbatan cistern, which held water for this palace and now it's converted into kind of a tourist attraction. You can walk through and it's raining inside and so they, they asked me to put, um, create an installation near these Medusa heads. And so I read about Medusa and her, the amazing stories and all the, you know, the, the different effects on culture and I decided to make um, this enchanted environment for Medusa where the branches are moving like the snakes in her hair. And then right after that, a uh, gallery in New York, Lehman Maupin, invited me to do a show and they gave me two months and I had seen a dervish performance in Istanbul, so I thought, well, maybe I can make trees that are inspired by the dervishes. Mm -hmm. Technical yeah. question. Do you use fractals when you're designing <laughs> your trees? Um, I know. Some of the texture maps are generated with fractal, but no, I would say not. Because the branching could be. Yeah. You might have to ask the programmer. His name is Duncan Brismead, and he's at Maya now in, in Canada. And he invented all these tools and, that I get to use. Um, this is a still, uh, this is my first panorama piece. So there's four projectors running in sync. So I got to figure that out. What did and you it was call it? A panorama. Oh, panorama. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, I had made another piece called They Eat Their Wounded. And my mom, she asked me, what, is that about our, your, uh, your uncle who was cannibalized? And I said, 
I had an uncle who was cannibalized, and because <laughs> I'm from Minnesota, so you understand that, right? <laughs> um, so, um, she said, yeah, there's a book. So I got the book and I read about it. And so he wasn't cannibalized, but some of his shipmates were. He is World War I. They were on a boat that was built far too quickly uh, in, out of Oregon, Portland, Oregon. Uh, they were sailing. Uh, they had just left Guam. They were, the boat was full of ammunition and gasoline. And they were struck by lightning. And everybody had to get off very quickly. And he was on a, a lifeboat that had too many sailors. And uh, it's called the Dumaru. And um, after a few days, after maybe 11 days, he drank seawater, which you're not supposed to do that. They, and uh, he went crazy. He thought he had a nail stuck in his head, and he passed away. And they didn't eat, they didn't eat him, but they, so they did use him for, for fuel. So they burned him. And they made a condenser that converted seawater into tiny drops of water. So, yeah. So this was from his two points of view. One, in, I'm putting him in heaven. I didn't really know him. He was 19 when he passed away <laughs> during World War I. And um, from in the ocean. another family, well, it's a self-portrait. And I guess it's, um, it's the, the story of Rapunzel. In the beginning, um, Rapunzel's parents lived next door to a witch. And my uh, family actually lived next door, across the street from witches. And this, you understand, it's Minnesota. I can keep saying that. It's sort of funny. You people might get it. <laughs> Maybe not, but. Um, and. In the story, um, Rapunzel's parent or Rapunzel's mother has cravings for this flower called rampion, which kind of looks like that. The, and uh, people used to put it on salads and things. And um, the witch said, "Well, you, I'll trade your daughter for the for the flowers." And then she ended up in the tower and her, grew her hair out. And you know the whole story. So. For me, my parents were alcoholics, and they gave up their children for their obsessions, for their cravings. So that's I, what I like to do: is is take a negative and turn it around. And you'll you'll see that a little bit, like Dumaru, I would say, is that the story of Rapunzel? Oh, it skipped. Oh, maybe it played. Okay, yeah. Um, sorry, on <laughs> to the next one. Um, this is a slanted wall at the Denver Art Museum in their new edition, built by Daniel Liebskin. And so a lot of the walls are angled, and this one's 45. And so this is also a panorama, three projections running at the same time. And it's an invisible surface being revealed by a virtual image. So I thought that was a nice combination Something invisible, the rocky surface from the Rocky Mountains, perhaps, uh, revealed by a virtual cloth. And it was really nice how they just disappeared into the little lip. Did anyone ever run into it? Mm -hmm. so I don't think so. Little, like, the wall is pretty. Walls. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe. They probably people tried to run up it. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, this, this is in Dallas. These panels move across the building. It's a public art piece. Maybe if I hit, there we go. Ah. Oh. So there's actually two sides of these panels forming a corridor. It's crazy. It's sort of slanted inward. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So how does the camera know where to go? Where's the projector? There's no projector. It's LED. Oh. Yeah, it's like giant LED signs moving across the building. 
This is sort of insane idea. It's probably the most difficult animation for me to consider because I got to design how the panels moved and relate the artwork. So it's Texas flowers. It's a kind of crazy story because I was the first piece on this. Um, they changed the speed of the panels. They, at first they were gonna go twice as fast and then, then they realized, oh, physics or whatever, would gravity, there's no way they could do that. And so that changed things a bit. And then they realized that if they have speakers mounted to the building, the building becomes like a giant speaker and you can hear all the sound throughout the building. And of course they had renters and businesses inside the building, so they couldn't do that. <laughs> so it's kind of all these interesting, oh, and then one more thing is, I guess while they were building it, the tracks that run this fell off. <laughs> There's a lot of engineering and re-engineering, and they did it. So that was a while ago too. Then um, I've ma been making a series of different trees for uh, teachers who have inspired me. The first one was my teacher, Miss Zanerald, from first grade. We made sponge trees, you know, you sponge the trunk and then you draw the leaves. And she singled me out and said I made the best trees in class. So I made a dedication for her. But um, Mike Kelly is a well-known artist. Uh, he was also my teacher, so I, I made him a series of trees. All right, there you go. Uh, this is a huge wall of poisonous flowers. I, at this point, I've made quite a few flowers and I had to kind of organize them in a database. And there's different categories, uh, like flowers for witches, flowers that are um, different colors, uh, poisonous, uh, edible. So this got to be the, so about 75 different poisonous flowers. So you didn't like Daisy? I didn't? Daisy Daisy Bell and it's poisonous. Yeah, daisy, you don't, you don't eat daisies. Oh, don't well, eat okay. the daisies, no, remember? I one of your teachers. Oh, no, no. <laughs> 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 Sorry. No, I didn't have a teacher named Daisy Bell. <laughs> Although, um, let's see, what, I'm going to get the history wrong. Um, daisy Bell is the first song that a computer sang and it's also used in 2001 as the computer's dying. So it's a reference to that, actually. Yeah, well, Bell Labs, was it Bell Labs? Do you remember all this? I have a terrible memory. Yeah, anybody know? If I get any facts wrong, you can correct me. And then, probably, okay. This is a, another public art piece, and I've done a few pieces where I collaborate with children at museums. So these are children's drawings that are then scanned and uh, played on the LED display on this building. It was meant to happen in real time. I doubt they ever really got it together to do that. I also made a, a tree piece uh, where children made leaves and then they're put onto the tree and that was part of a fundraiser for the Hammer Museum. It was kind of fun to, re to use other sources. Uh, this is a piece called Orbit. It's kind of a science fiction piece. Um, it's orbiting through a year for some planet in about three minutes. So it's going through the seasons. I also think of it as um, inspired by Jackson Pollock's paintings, but as an animation. Is that LED also? No. <laughs> oh, good question. This one, no, this one's projection. Yeah, at that time, that would have been a million dollar LED display. Uh, now it's oh. probably $400,000 LED display. <laughs> They're pretty expensive. They're coming down, though. 
how big is it? Uh, did I put the dimensions? So oh, that would have been nice. Mm, it's two projections. That's probably 15 feet high by, oh, okay. yeah, 40, 40 feet maybe. I'm guessing. Oh, that's my dealer from LA. <laughs> Hi, Randy. <laughs> it's a really nice museum, actually, if you're there. Also, uh, another public art piece um, The Walk of Fame with the Stars, you know, in Hollywood. Uh, this is a section on Vine. And um, they were, this is new construction, so 1% of the budget went towards uh, creating a piece. And so there's some stars right in front of the building. And the first star um, that I noticed was Orson Welles. And so I, I thought about, uh, you know, the, probably the m most important movie in film history would, might be Citizen Kane. And that's all about finding Rosebud. So I took off from that idea and uh, looked at the films of the uh, people who are acknowledged in front of this building and looked for films that had flowers as part of the plot in some way. So uh, you can see the, um, like Audrey Hepburn was a flower girl in My Fair Lady, for example. And, okay, I was in, invited to create an installation uh, for the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego. And they have a, a building that was a baggage terminal for the train station, so it's huge. And um, they asked me to do something. And so when you drive from Los Angeles to San Diego, exactly in the middle is a nuclear power plant, which the Sanofi, but it's actually turned off now. But it's <coughs> also on the ocean, which that's just that's just ridiculous. At any rate, I, I always get a little bit scared driving past there, and so I thought it would make a piece inspired by uh, radiation and, um, uh, oh, what am I thinking? Well, I was, I was researching uh, uh, nuclear bombs and nuclear radiation, and one name I came across was uh, Marie Curie, and I thought, well, you know, I learned about her in school, but not really. And so I read her biographies. And she was I mean, an incredible person. So I thought, OK, I'll take this negative and turn it around and make it a dedication to Marie Curie, who she discovered radium, which is an element which you cannot see, and polonium, which is another element. So she was an extremely important scientist for us, although also <laughs> led to nuclear stuff, which is horrible. but. Um, in her biography written by one of her daughters, um, there's a mention of flowers throughout. And I'm the only person who would probably read you know, a biography on Madame Curie and come up with the flowers, but you know, I did. So I decided to use that as the dedication. So some of the flowers that are mentioned are animated. Also, uh, her other daughter also won Nobel Prize as well. So she, Marie won, God, did she win two? Too. She won two um, Nobel Prizes, and her daughter was also won one too as well. Sorry, I think that sounds like I need water. Uh, this was an installation uh, for New Orleans Museum of Art. It was part of uh, Prospect New Orleans, which was uh, created to revitalize New Orleans after Katrina. It was interesting to be there. You'd walk through the streets, and there'd be clouds of gas. I mean, you know the it was a crazy time. But um, so I created this piece. This, this Rodin used to be in front of this um, de architectural detail. So I researched Rodin because I needed to move him. And I made a dedication to Rodin. <laughs> so it's, he's also in heaven with my uncle, great uncle. I don't know if they know each other, though, if it's possible. Uh, this is Minneapolis, and it should still be there. Uh, it's per I guess it's pretty permanent. It's, um, it's well, uh, Stephen Hawking created a television show for us normal people, or I shouldn't say normal, us 
or whatever, just regular type people who don't have genius brains. And so he explained cosmology and how we all came to be. And the, uh, the explanation is called panspermia. It's when an asteroid breaks through the atmosphere, uh, it melts, and the microbes that are there form life on you know, our planet. So perhaps that's how we came to be. And so I, I thought, well, that sounds so random. So I'd made asteroids that have graffiti on them. So I, love it. So I don't know. This is what really happened. <laughs> it's Sunday, right? I can tell you this on Sunday. Wow. So it was originally made for this gallery in Spain. And then um, in Minneapolis, they invited me. And um, they said, what can you do for this dome? And I just looked up, oh, asteroids. And it, and it just all fell together. And it was kind of amazing. Uh, the projectors fit perfectly. They were hidden inside the walls. That's like a miracle. OK, here's Judy Crook, who's, this is a different version. I should say which one that is. I have no idea. It, um, she was my color teacher at Art Center. She was a genius, for sure. She was just an amazing teacher. She always spoke a little bit above you. And so you always strived to, to, you know, be, more, to be more like her. Um, this is in, um, in China at American Embassy in Guangzhou. Um, when they, so this is another one where they were building the architecture. And then something changed, and they didn't tell me about it. So I, we were going to show something else. And so two weeks before everything was going to happen, I, they, they showed me the walls, and I was, uh-oh. <laughs> so I, I decided to make a bouquet of trees, which was actually a better idea for like a welcoming bouquet or something. So it seemed to work out better anyway. So it's, it was, I think for me in my life, adversity sometimes leads to better things, I guess. I'll, Jennifer, I'll, how do you get these commissions? Like, hmm. do, you, do you market them yourself? Do you have, I'm thinking if I'm no. an artist, how, I would ask you, how do you get It's the, the traditional way. Uh, art galleries and people call up the galleries and so the the curator for um, all the consulates she's a, uh, she's and she knows all the art galleries in New York and so yeah it just works out this I mean sometimes as people know me or I do have a website so they know you, yeah mm-hmm yep oh this is a public art piece uh, it's it's a German uh, mesh material that has LEDs woven into it, so it actually forms a transparency. So when there's light, it's opaque, and when the lights are off, you can see through it. And projection works the same way, actually. If there's no light, it's transparent. So it made a lot of sense for me to play around with this material. Also, it was a courthouse, and I had to think about uh, what I could show in a, in a card. I really wanted to make a sign that said, you're guilty, you're guilty, you're guilty. That, that would be bad. <laughs> that would be so fun, though, wouldn't it? <laughs> oh, oh, well. Missed opportunities. Uh, it's called Diaspora. It's uh, plants propagate by breaking up and spreading their seeds. And I had first shown this in Hong Kong. And I didn't go there at first, but I was thinking of Diaspora for people. And um, when I got to Hong Kong, there was no diaspora, which is everything's clean. So it was like, because when you're making a piece like this or flowers or whatever, you notice, you'll just notice, oh, there's some leaves and stuff, or you notice, you know, I'll you know, focus on flowers if I'm modeling flowers. So when I got there, it was so strange. OK, I got to um, play around with Times Square with about 63 displays. Yep. I showed my piece called Botanic. It's kind of ex its flowers contained and they explode and fill the space that they're in. 
it was fun. It was very exciting because people honked their horns and everything would stop. <laughs> so, kind of, you'd, oh, here's a little excerpt of it. So, it was originally made for the Stanford Hospital. It was flowers from mm, their, their gardens. Then I ch uh, for New York, I, I added condolence flowers because of 9-11. That's an interactive piece. <laughs> She's my programmer. So this, it's using um, a little plug-in for Unity, the software I use, um, called Affectiva. And Affectiva looks at the um, camera on your on your computer or on your television. And what it's meant, what it was created for perhaps was for advertising. So if you're watching your TV and you look happy while they're showing you Cheerios, they, they know they've done their job. So you really should tape over the camera on your TV. But there's other things you can do with the software. So, because it, so it, it recognizes your facial expression. And so I made this sort of puppet that it uh, takes a video of your face and then maps it onto this 3D uh, face that I modeled. And then I, an I animated different positions, facial positions. And so it's kind of like a funny, it mocks you, but it's also your puppeteering this, this little face. So it's kind of fun. Also, it was created for um, a talk I gave in New York. So would, there was also a camera on the back of the tablet that would pick up the audience. Okay. Oh, you might recognize this one. Is, this is, it's actually started as a double projection. Yes. So uh, the face, mm -hmm. is it able to recognize any expression and model it or only so Quite a few. Quite a few. Um, what's his name? Um, <coughs> The, the TV show Lie to Me used the research of Eccles, Paul Ekman, Paul Ekman. And he studied the, the basic facial expressions. And then the software, Affectiva, utilized those same to sort of categorize. So they can pick up quite a few. Um, well, I think there's seven basic ones, like happy, sad, mad, contempt. <laughs> I shouldn't do that as an audience. Um, it's kind of, Ekman has a really fun website where you can uh, learn about micro expressions, but you have to give them money. But I did that. It was fun. Jennifer, so are all the objects that you have moving or shapes or whatever, are you drawing them on a computer before you mm -hmm. put them together? Um, well, I'll, I'll sculpt them in 3D right. with different 3D modeling tools. Like, if you make a contour and revolve it around, that might make an apple, for example. But very you, simply. I mean, you are a painter when you're doing mm -hmm. that. You are a painter. Yeah, and then I, I paint the, the texture that wraps around the 3D shape. So and then I create the lighting. So the lighting in this piece, oh, I don't know, <laughs> a while. I just made a new one of this one. Um, it took me about two months. Yeah, sometimes it, it, it just do a lot of renderings over and over again. I was, I was going for um, trying to simulate the lighting and Dutch painting, because I love Dutch still life painting. Uh, and I, I mean, I'm never quite there because it's a completely different medium, but I, it, it, you know, it's a good goal. Oh, sorry. So I was just wondering what software you use typically for this mm -hmm. project. Um, it's Maya. Oh, I use Maya too. Oh, and I'm using, now I'm, I used to use Director to display the videos and interact with them a little bit. Um, now I use Unity. Okay. Uh, here's another piece. Uh, this is created for uh, the USC Department of STEM Biology and Regenerative Medicine. And so I, it was really fun. I got to um, research stem cells. And because uh, a lot of their researchers deal with, with those kinds of issues. And um, uh, 
the, probably the most amazing thing to learn was uh, they don't really need to use stem cells anymore because you can take uh, other types of cells, like skin cells, and reverse them, and they become stem cells by changing the, the protein makeup. Now, of course, I'm saying this all wrong, but um, it's a pretty recent development. So I decided to make a, uh, a piece with fruits, which are the ovaries of um, the plant world. And then well, this will play. Seems like it skipped, maybe not. This was a public art piece in Philadelphia a couple years ago. Uh, we built these 26 by 13 foot high domes. There's four of them in the uh, Benjamin Franklin Parkway. And so there's, oh, I don't know, about seven or eight museums around this parkway. And they were somehow my clients. And they all wanted to be represented by this piece somehow, which is sort of, I don't know what, you know, I, I just stumble into things, I guess. I maybe need to pay attention. But um, I realized, well, you know, this whole parkway is named after Benjamin Franklin, and I've done all these other pieces with science and scientists and honoring them. So I, I researched Benjamin Franklin, and one of his main, dis oh, I think I got, yeah. One of his main discoveries um, was that static electricity, oh, we have, we can do it here. <laughs> Static electricity and lightning are the same thing. And so um, back in the Enlightenment period, nobody knew that. And so he actually is one of uh, the most important scientists. And so I decided to um, create a piece about that. But not, you know, I'm an artist, so it's not exactly about electricity. But it's sort of a microscopic view of what happens in the clouds when small particles of ice bump into each other and form a static charge and then form lightning. But How many projectors did it oh, take to do a dome? Each, each dome has four, and they were up on poles about 90 feet apart from each. You can see, usually you can see one. Oh, maybe not. It was, I didn't get to see it in the snow. It's a shame, but it looks yeah. pretty great. Yeah. The, the nice thing about doing public art is uh, people came up to me in the street and said, oh, are you the artist? And then they thanked me profusely. And that does not happen in galleries. So the, it was really touching. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I bet not very many artists are going to even admit to that, right? So it would run in the evening. It was meant to, uh, it's called winter fountains um, because fountains are shut off in the winter, as you well know, and um, it was meant to replace them. <clears throat> Jennifer, and uh, the artist, in my mind, it's extremely important to be preserved. Mm -hmm. so, so then oh. others after us are going to be able to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. so how do you, uh, how this kind, your kind of art, which is so unique, oh God. it's preserved? Mm -hmm. Well, I do what I can to make everything clear and documented. Um, people do buy it, so then they get directions. They, um, I'll give them render, like that piece is all rendered, so I'll, uh, it's rendered at a, at at least double the resolution of what a projector is today, although that's changing rapidly. Uh, like your TVs are now 4K. So I'm sort of, sort of lying, because I, I really should be rendering at least 8K, but maybe more, but that's just huge files and a lot of rendering time. So that's my goal, is I always uh, give collectors work at least double the resolution. So that the tree here, um, which was purchased by the museum. They, they have all the files to remake the piece, to migrate it to the next. Although it could be shown at this resolution on a 8K projector and that would be fine. So it should, it should work out. Maybe I need a foundation. <laughs> and do you keep a, 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 a copy, 
Mm -hmm. on, yes. on your hands, so yes. if anything were to go wrong, you could still recreate it? Oh, yes, absolutely, yes. And I have copies saved in other at UCLA, where I work, and I, ha I migrated all my files from my Silicon Graphics to, so I can even open most of my old files from way back when. So, yeah, I'm pretty good about migrating. I'm trying to keep it all up. Yeah, if I, if I remade the piece, it would be totally different. And was, you just can't do that. I can imagine that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know museums will never give a painting to an artist to retouch, because they'll just remake it. Yeah. That's, just, that's just a rule. <laughs> but it's true. <laughs> Yeah, because you want to you want to keep it's never finished. You want to keep, you know, working on it. This was made for the Clark in Massachusetts last year. Um, they had this beautiful Tadeo Ando building. It was up on the hill, so I showed a few different pieces there. Um, they there's a lot of birch trees in around the area, so. That's very Minnesota. <laughs> oh, it is. <laughs> well, aha. Uh -huh. Well, I love birch trees. And you know, when the branches fall off, it leaves eyes behind. And so I called this blind eye. It's kind of a pun on the idea of a blind of trees. And then also, uh, it's, uh, there's, um, it's a, the layout, there's no perspective really. It's the way you might see if, you, if you're covering an eye or if you have monocular vision. Um, the perspective is formed by layering, by shift in color, by changes of speed. So the leaves in the background, oh, I have to think about this, move faster than the ones in the foreground. Um, so kind of playing with that idea. And it also de dematerializes the space in a different way if there's no, uh, for, uh, what's the word, one point, two point perspective. This loops through the season. Are all of your pieces loops? Mm. Oh, yes. Yes. Back. In fact, there's usually no beginning, middle, or end. It's more of a continuation. So, yes. Do any of them generate their own variation? The interactive pieces do. Oh. Yeah. I'll show you one in a minute. Yeah, this would be too crazy to make it uh, interactive. Uh, there's just way too many shapes. It's actually rendered in three layers and put together. Each of the trees a separate, a separate instance. Um, they are mo each one's a different model. Okay. Yeah, there's a lot of them. This is in Kansas City, at um, oh my gosh, open spaces. Thank you. So um, the architect Stephen Hall, he calls his windows lenses, mm -hmm. and so I thought, okay, I'm going to make these kind of like retinal you know, the, the retina on your eyeball. So it's sort of a play on that. And this, this building is, uh, is illuminated from the inside at night. And so I actually was a, a lot of, <clears throat> I had to go take some extra steps to make sure the projection was gonna be as bright as the building. Otherwise it would just kind of die. This one is still working hard. <laughs> it's, there's a lot of peaches in there, and they, they're, they want, they're very politicized. <laughs> and this kind of, it's using uh, animation effect. It's called dynamics. And you can make something it, it's more squishy. And so I, I just upped the squishiness a little bit. You can ma really make them squishy, but you have to hold back. <laughs> and this, 
I think I'm getting better at the lighting, like the, the Dutch still life sort of lighting. That was, I'm still going for that, this one. <coughs> then I was invited uh, to do a dance, 90 minutes of animation for uh, Merce Cunningham's birthday. And this was at the, it was held in three cities. And so I did one of the cities, Los Angeles at Royce Hall. So it's just an excerpt. I showed a lot of different pieces with that one. And one more piece. This I had actually created for the performance, but that I'd scared them, so. <laughs> <laughs> <coughs> I thought it'd be great to have dancers, you know, interacting with the video. But. So this is a real-time piece. Um, it's using VR uh, sensors, but no VR headgear. Um, Paul Allen, one of the uh, founders of Microsoft, he um, built these things called holodomes. He's very fascinated by the holodeck, you know, on Star Trek, which we still don't have. Which, I mean, we have those walkie-talkie things as our cell phones, but we don't. There's a few things we still need to get. So at any rate, um, I was invited to a workshop to make something for the holodome, so I made a variation of this piece, and now I, I've since have put it outside the holodome and onto walls. So it's, it is using the Vive sensors, and the fruits follow you around, and so two, two people can play and steal each other's fruits, mm -hmm. or as you walk around, um, you're creating like giant sculptures of fruit, basically. Do you love fruit? <laughs> <laughs> I do. That's, yeah, I returned my fruit this morning and got nicer fruit. <laughs> yeah, you're probably not allowed to do that here, right? I found that out. Oh, well. Ah, yeah, blueberries and raspberries are really good. Yes? Did you have to scale back on some rendering or, 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 or on some technical aspects to make this piece interactive? No, no, not at all. It runs on a small... Intel Nook, which does VR, which is quite nice because it's so little. There's other things I can complain about, but about Intel, but that part's really great. Yeah, I also use their really small computers for playing these pieces. But yeah, no, it's, that's not a problem. Um, not, no, yeah, there's a lot of small, uh, like little bits. Let's see if I can get you to play again. Yeah. Oh, you probably can't see it. Yeah. You're, it's a little limiting with uh, VR or playing in real time because the lighting uh, quality is not as nice. So you have to sacrifice a little bit for that. But I, I think I got it as good as like, I mean, I'm, I'm happy with it for sure. And it's fun. It's, yeah. Do you ever have any security issues with your computers if they're out in the public somewhere? Um, once I had some equipment stolen at, at um, Union Station in Los Angeles when I created a piece for them, but I think it was some drills. <laughs> 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 but, um, oh, it, the piece in Philadelphia, somebody, yeah, somebody climbed up the pole and took a hammer and smashed the glass in front of the projector. Uh, it didn't ruin anything, though, I guess. They just replaced the glass. But you know, the, the poles, they, there was no foundation. They were just uh, pinned into the ground. Mm -hmm. So that was a really insane thing to do. It was insane for them to, the contractors to do it that way, but oh, just, it's fun. So, some things you have to you cross your fingers and that everything's gonna work. But generally, I don't have too many problems. I guess once somebody changed the zoom, on a piece, because I did like to put projectors low, so you would cast shadows in the work. I mean, so that made the projectors more vulnerable. So I probably do that less now. It's true. Yeah, but that was the last one. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Uh, do you do you uh, do you get 
as your skills, just technical skills, get better, does that give you further ideas, or do you just get the, get the skills to get to? to yeah, you get the you get the idea, and then you get the skills. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you research how to do it. Like when I did the first panorama, I had no idea how to program uh, the software to run in sync. So I ended up contacting um, what's the science museum in New York with the big. Well, Anyway, I found somebody there, and she, she had uh, written a program for the software I was using. And she let me see her code. And so, yeah, so what are, you know, I had a month to figure that out. But it always works. It's amazing. You just have to believe it, you know. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit about your training and background? Mm. Um, let's see. <laughs> um, I went, I moved from, I, I moved to California to go to Art Center in Pasadena. Uh, I started in advertising, switched to graphic design. My friends were fine artists, so I kept taking art classes. So I wasn't going to graduate. I took an um, exchange class at Caltech called Video Art, and that was taught by uh, Gene Youngblood, who, um, he, the, bo the book he was basing the course on was called Expanded Cinema, which showed some of the first structuralist film experiments with projection and film. And he also showed us some of the first computer animation, like people like Ed M. Schweller. And um, I was driving home from Caltech that day, and uh, my head exploded. I, I, I actually had a Satori experience. And usually you're supposed to turn religious at that point, but I realized, oh, this is what I need to do. So um, I, I went to Art Center and I said, you know, maybe I could take some film classes and do this and that so that maybe I can graduate. They, and my advisor or chairperson, he said, uh, you should just drop out. So <laughs> I did, and I started working in Hollywood and uh, learned computers uh, at the, on the job. I had worked at Robert Abel and Associates on Tron, a little, tiny little bit. I mean, really, I was a newbie. And uh, let's see, I, I decided to go to CalArts. I went there for a quarter, and then my friends were moving to New York, and I decided to move to New York with them. And uh, I started working in animation in New York, and then somebody there said, well, maybe you should teach uh, at, uh, at Pratt. So I got a, a job there. And then New York was driving me crazy. So I moved back to LA. And I went to Art Center and said, you know, I, I know how to teach this stuff. And they hired me. And they had one of the first silicon graph. I don't know if, which number it was. It was very early, one of the first uh, silicon graphics computers. And nobody knew how to use it. And so I sat down and just read the manuals and learned how to use it. And here I am. <laughs> and then I, I finished, let's say I started teaching. So I was teaching at Art Center, and then I finished my degree there. And they also gave me an honorary degree, which was nice. But you can't really call yourself a doctor, though, with that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it's sort of funny. So you are you are teaching now and making your work. Mm -hmm. How do you? Yeah. Do oh gosh. Well, I teach half time, so that's how I. I don't know how I do it. I, somehow. I mean, this morning I was working on my course notes right before this because so, I'm teaching a VR class, and I I don't use it enough to really have it in my brain. So I have to practice, like do a rehearsal before I teach it. Have you tried? <clears throat> have you thought about doing any of your work in VR? Well, the one piece with with the headset, no. Um, never made a piece for the headset, no. I don't think I will. I, I something about interacting and transforming space mm -hmm. is important for me. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, you never say never. I mean, the the one piece, oh, the AR piece with the tablet, perhaps. I know I'm going to be making a, a piece for uh, in for San Antonio. Um, I don't know what it'll be yet, but it's definitely be an interactive piece with, and I want it to be squishy. That's 
and maybe floaty. <laughs> so it maybe starts like that, and so you start with, a, and then it, it grows into what it is. And for uh, when I was making a, a piece for a courthouse in Long Beach, and I had to convince a judge that you know this was a good idea. I'd actually had another experience with a judge, and he, he kicked my work out. He's you know halfway through the process. I had already made the piece. He said, "I don't trust you," and <laughs> he was appointed by a Republican and whatever. So he was. <laughs> Sorry if I'm insulting anybody. I actually have Republican friends. <laughs> it's interesting. Um, at any rate, so, so, so uh, in order to convince the judge, I, I researched intuition. And I said to her, you know, the decisions that you make are similar to the decisions I make as, because we're both using intuition to, you know, we, it's like um, intuition is, Somebody who practices making decisions like an artist um, becomes intuitive because you're like just to draw a line, you're making millions of decisions as you're you know drawing this line. So to me, I I, I saw that as a, this interesting parallel. So yeah, so I'm fascinated by you know how how we decide. So yes. Oh, you two ask a lot of questions. <laughs> no, go ahead. Yeah, I can skip it. No problem. Uh, it's it's a kind of a technical question. You mm -hmm. made a remark to the effect that you have issues with Intel. Like with what? Intel, the company. Oh. <laughs> like, what are the problems? That oh, you have? just graphics cards issues. Oh, like, if yeah, you, exactly. yeah, it changes. Uh, it, it's inconsistent. I mean, I, I just I just call them. And bug them. Call. I've called and bugged them more than other companies. But I saw it's weird. So you're not using Nvidia cards? Um, it's whatever's built in because they're such small. Oh. I think it is Nvidia. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They'll say, "Oh, call Nvidia." I'm like, oh. "Yeah, I call everybody." But yeah, because you have to get it to work. Um, I mostly use uh, these little A Open computers from China. Although that might be hard to get <laughs> coming soon, but th they just work out pretty well. Some I don't know I don't know what makes them not work with the graphics. It's I mean you probably wouldn't have the problem because you're not connecting to a, a lot of projectors. But, so, sorry, you are using these little computers for the actual projection or for the mm -hmm. rendering that you do kind of in the background when you create a piece? Um, I use bigger computers for rendering. Okay. I mean I could. It would just be very slow. So, yeah. Yes? So, oh gosh, it's so I weird. I use Falcon being computers. Hmm? Falcon. They're made in Oregon. They're good because they, they really keep up with um, the most recent processors and things. So, yeah. I, try, I used to be an avid Dell user, but they were just, they'd be a couple years behind. So. I mean, they have a huge market, and they do. I mean, they build really nice computers. So, um, but they're probably too cautious. <laughs> but maybe they have to be. Yeah. Um, yes. Do you do all of your sketching on the computer? So that you're I do. You're never with a pencil in your hand. I made one piece that broke my rule um, called Sharpie, and I made drawings of Sharpies and then scanned them in. Um, but yeah, everything's in the computer. It seems to be, you know, you make a rule that like keep things consistent, and so I did. Yeah, no, I don't. Yeah, these are all painted um, with Photoshop and um, what should we call it? Tablets. Mm. And I'm probably mostly use a mouse for painting, which is really awkward. <laughs> So yes. you do a lot of floaty things. Have you ever done like marchy things or marching or or jerky or anything? Because uh, they're very mm. flowing. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if you've had uh -huh. any other rhythm, any rhythm. Or my my work used to be a lot faster. I think when you're younger, you um, you can you know you really appreciate something. I think that's also why I scared that judge because I made the trees move really fast and. 
So, but as you get older, you, you want things slower. It's so peculiar. <laughs> yeah, I never understood when I was, you know, in my like early 30s and people would say to me, it's moving so fast. I was, what do you mean? <laughs> like, you know, yeah, I even drive slower now. Yeah. Other questions? All right. Okay, thank you. Let's